you'll see the show change from it used to be a show where people arrived and bought you know a thousand computers or you know 20 white interactive whiteboards now the children are arriving with the technology and that's having a huge and profound impact i think on on the whole thing we've gone we've gone if you like to this point where we're simply saying to the kids look you know bring your stuff and, and the school will provide the things that make the stuff work. That will be screens, but it will be a better curriculum, it will be more engaging tasks, it will be a different organisation of the day, it will be a different relationship with the teachers, it will be a very, very different place. Have you got five minutes more? Okay, then, then it's worth just reflecting on, on, um, on just this little example. So, we were faced with the task of building um, a classroom of tomorrow. This was the um, this was a space we designed. It was a world classroom. This was back in the year 2002, so a long time ago. And uh, we spent quite a lot of time. We had some great drawings, and uh, we had multiple points of focus, which is exactly where we're going now with um, the spaces. We had high ceiling, we can control the light levels and the ventilation. We had an artist's impression of how lovely our, our school, our classroom would be. And then we had to build it. We built it in fiberglass. So I prefer the boat builders. I like boats, so we've got boat builders to build it, you know, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and we built it and it was pretty fabulous. Uh, and it was a place that, where all technology would work. Well, look what happened when we, when we put children into it and ask them to learn. And, and I think this is a really powerful articulation of what's happening to, to learning. Well, this is the Ingenium, and this is what our project is about. And it's basically a classroom, it's called Classroom of the Future. And it's, in our school, it's like an ordinary classroom, but it's much bigger and it's much more spacious. It, it wasn't bigger, it had less furniture and it felt bigger, so I just thought that. It's a lot different in, in some ways, but even though we still have ordinary everyday lessons inside it. Basically, students were asked what kind of learning the environment they would like to work in, and that's what they came up with. So you've got the wide open doors, you've got the colour, you've got all the space, and you don't get the teacher-student barrier anymore. It's kind of broken down and they've worked together, whereas in Colossians, the teacher's telling you what to do and you're reading from the textbook. That's a pretty powerful articulation, I think. But I just remind you that was 2004, so that was a decade ago. You know, so uh, we've known this a long time. And I think what you see changing around this show, and indeed around your own education system, is I think the children have gone from a point of expecting it to be better to feeling that they're entitled for it to be better. And I think that's a very, very significant, very profound change. Uh, look, we've got time for just a few questions. I don't know if anybody wants to ask anything, but I'd be really happy to tackle any questions, really. I mean, gosh, there's so many of you, but um, we can do that really, really easily. Does anybody want to ask anything in particular? Or is that enough already? Yes, yes. <laughs> So the question is about the digital divide, what happens to, and I think this is really significant, I don't, I'm not saying here this is a one-to-one -one world, and I'm not saying it's an expensive world, indeed one of the really interesting things about the iPad is the way in which it works for multiple children, I've just been looking at some software, where's the software designer, oh, she's gone I think, but there's like somebody who's designed software that three children sitting around an iPad can use, they've been much more collaborative, I think, than the, the laptop, there's something about sitting behind a laptop and all the children we've asked so far on the on the connection I've said if you got mugged in the street and they were going to take your phone or your tablet or your laptop or your desktop computer what would be the one thing you would try and hang on to and half of them said our phones and half of them said our tablets so I think we're in a world of diversity but diversity matters and that's why I'm really saying we're in that bring a browser world 
rather than a, you must all have a powerful laptop. Different children have got very clearly different needs. All the surveys suggest, I think, that um, the, the ownership of technology is quite pervasive. We've probably got somewhere between 10 and 15 percent where we need to address that problem. But that's a tiny problem and we can afford to do that. If we were having the conversation 10 years ago, it would have been 50 percent of the children we'd have been intervening with. Look at how the cost of these things have come down and down and, and down and down. I mean, it's quite interesting. I was in an um, example really here. I was doing some work in, um, in Dublin. They wanted to be able to try and get children into programming and engineering, what our Minister of Education has been talking about today. And my solution for getting them into programming was to get them to build exhibitions all around Dublin. This was a, this, this group of children programmed their computer so they could have a game of Pong projecting onto the building opposite. You can see the ball is bouncing off the architectural features of the building. And I think these big collaborative projects, these shared projects, are very different to the one-to-one -one sort of one piece of technology, one child projects. I think these are very, very accessible and, and honestly much more. Um, this was a good project, but we had many crashes in the road, unfortunately. <laughs> People kept looking at that. <laughs> but it worked very well and it made programming suddenly very sexy. You know, the children all wanted to program uh, as a result. So it's a great it's a great little solution. And I just do think we're in that really nice situation where there's a, there's a project going on here on the stand where we're asking children to collect 100 faces in 100 places. And we're saying each face, we want it to be one number in a century. So he's 13, she's 14. You know, so this is, this is your life going past, really, in the century. It's wonderfully accessible. It gets the children out into the community. But what's interesting now is that this is um, Alex Blomt here somewhere who's programmed this to run on iPad, so you can, you'll be able to download this soon from the, um, the App Store. What's interesting is, because what happens when you start, you know, if you've got 100 people in your town, you've got 100 in your town, you've got 100 in your town, won't it be interesting to contrast them? Because as well as their photographs, we're looking at their breakfast their journey to school, their best learning experience. So suddenly what starts off as a little, nice little exercise in one community for a few people suddenly becomes a way of joining up around the world. They learn so much from it. One of the things they learned, for example, was that um, smoking is very bad for you. Here's a, let me just move the bar out of the way, put it up the top. They, um, yeah, this, this woman was a, was a heavy smoker and the children all said, oh, you can see she's a smoker because she appears out of sequence. She looks older than she should be because of the effect of tobacco. I mean, it would be very hard to tell children that, but they could see it very, very quickly. They also, they were fascinated to see in their own community just how sharp and bright people were in their 90s. Let's just go through to, um, to the 90s. Look how sharp these eyes are. People in their 90s are just are so alert. They're so, isn't it fascinating? Look at them. The, uh, this, this old fella here, the children, they were primary school children, they said to him, aren't you worried you're going to die because you're 95? And he said, he was good at maths, he said, uh, he said, no, I've got a better chance of living to 96 than any one of you. <laughs> Which is a great answer, you know. But of course, when, um, yeah, we should stop a minute. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we should stop. When um, when Lambton School, the children here, did this exercise for the first time, they did it with children in Africa, and of course, they couldn't find anybody over about 55 because everybody was dead. You know, so little tiny projects start off as a community project and then give you insights into the way the world works. That's absolutely the bit that we really want. Well, look, we better stop. I'll leave you with this old fella. <laughs> Thanks for all coming. Gosh, enjoy the show. Oh, no, no. Happy <laughs>